live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. We're back. I'm Stu Miniman here with Justin Warren and you're watching Silicon Angle Media's production of theCUBE live from Las Vegas at VMworld 2017. Always excited when we get to talk, talk to one of the end users at the show. Joe Cowan, first time on theCUBE, is a systems engineer with Carlisle Interconnect Technology. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So, so Joe, you know, software might be eating the world, but eventually you know, things live places um, and one of the things that connects it all together is, you know, it's, it's, it's the cabling and right. plant uh, and something. I mean, I've spent, you know, many years in my career, uh, you know, dealing with those sort of things. It's not all, you know, wireless and uh, uh, things like that. So, tell us a little bit about, you know, Carlisle, uh, you know, the, the organization itself and, and your role there. Sure. What I do, I'm an IT systems engineer, and the company as itself creates power and data cabling. So anything from commercial to military applications, airlines, uh, vehicles, heads-up displays, anything that requires special adapters, cables, and end connectors, that's what my company makes. Wow, um, you had nothing to do with the new MacBook Pros though, right? I would not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dongles, uh, you know, a a a and everything. Um, your role at the company, kind of, you know, what, what, what's your purview, uh, your, your team, and you know, how much stuff do you manage? Sure. Well, because my company has grown through acquisitions, you know, every site has their own intelligence for IT. So what we've done at the corporate level is try to bring that together. So my role as a systems engineer is to find those solutions, develop those solutions, document, package, and then turn over to the sites to execute. So my role is to make sure that compliance is met, security is maintained, and that the execution of those products and applications are actually deployed properly. Yeah, so, so, I mean something, you know, anybody that's dealing with kind of mergers and acquisitions, it's like, oh my gosh, what did I get this time? Is it, oh, that's something easy for me to change, or oh, hey, they're doing something cool that we never thought about. Um, you know, how's that typically go uh, for your environment? You know, do some of the acquiring companies, you know, kind of push back on, you know, kind of the, the, the new oversight? So it is very interesting. Yeah. So whenever an acquisition is done, we are very excited to find out who they have, what are they doing, and you know, we do have standards at a corporate level, but those standards can also be changed if they're doing something better than we are. We didn't think of that. That's a great idea. Let's all do that. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to assess all of that, look at it saying, that is a great idea. Let's redo what we've standardized and let's do this instead because it's not only better, they're using it better, they've actually documented it better and we adopt it across the board. So acquisitions become very exciting to what they're doing. Mm. All right. Joe, why, why don't you walk us through uh, your, your current infrastructure, your user of, uh, I guess we'll call it hyper-converged infrastructure. Sure. Uh, maybe you have, uh, you know, weren't looking for HCI when you looked out, but, but I'm curious, kind of, give us what led you down that, you know, decision tree. Sure. Um, and How do we uh, get from there to here? Yeah, well, you know, was there, was there something wrong before, or, you know, what was going on? Well, that's just yeah. it. You know, you, you find yourself in a position, and our position was the fact that we had an opportunity. We were ready to renew some legacy support on equipment we had across the board. And that was a great stopping point because now we're at a budgetary moment where we can say, we're at a great spot to where this is now legacy and depreciated. Do we need to do something else or should we continue with what we're doing? It was a great decision point. So our decision after evaluating the products that were out there and the ability to turn a vertical subject matter expert as storage controllers go and storage appliances, well look, you know, sometimes those are very specific. You have to be an SME to really get in, carve it up, pass it out, and make it available. Well, we wanted a product that didn't hone us into a single set of people. We chose a product that was easily deployable. We can train up very quickly all of our uh, system admins to actually maintain it, use it for backups, deploy, carve it up, and it was turns our subject matter experts across the board. So we didn't have to have all these verticals in our company of three people know that, two people know that. We were able to allow more people to easily understand and use it without having heavy training. 
Yeah, one of the things that uh, a lot of the hyper-converged uh, vendors will do, and in fact IT vendors in general, is that they focus on cost savings, um, particularly around things like operational simplicity, gives you operational mm -hmm. savings. But for this kind of, uh, for si this situation, it sounds more like you've actually retasked your staff to be doing different things. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about what you're actually doing now that you, that you weren't doing before, or right. perhaps doing more of. We were doing a lot more of. Right. So when it came to deploying something, we needed to allocate more storage, get more storage, expand more dynamically and quickly on demand. That was the reason we chose the products that we did is because now each person can actually look into the product that we're using, assess what's going on, and quickly decide what's going to happen next. So one of the things that was very important is that we ask all the people that work at the sites, because remember we grew through acquisitions, how, do you, how does your site do business? So if they didn't understand how their division or site was doing business, how are you making these technologies choices? You know, we can't just be reactive, you actually have to go learn how we're doing it so we can provide the service. So instead of saying, hey, we need this, no problem, we're flexible, here you go, yeah. that wasn't the model, especially financially, to stay in because that's too reactive. So getting in and having more meetings from the operator up to the operations CEO to actually find out how are we conducting business? Let me help you with these pieces, mm. we can do better. And that's where our technology went. Yeah, Joe, so I want to go back to that, that decision that you made. Was it, did you have some idea in your head that it was going to be HCI, or were you just kind of looking out at what the options were? What was the decision tree? And don't keep us in any suspense, what did you actually end up buying? Sure. You know? <laughs> so the decision tree was what we were going to choose to do next. Yeah. Was it viable to stay in our current storage array? And so after we looked at many products and many meetings, we did decide on Nutanix. And the reason why we did that is again, we can turn subject matter experts and divide that out because it's more easily understandable for more admins to operate in that zone. Okay. And, and so when you made that decision, mm -hmm. were you intending that you would then retask people and that's what, what drove it? Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's a really different kind of role for people who would be used to be doing, I'm, I'm a storage admin, that's mm -hmm. what I do. And now you, are in, you want me to go and do these other things. Can you talk to us about how did you manage that change? Did, were people embracing that change and ran towards it or did you have to convince some naysayers? Well, we got to see people's personalities come out. Right. And so people that were very accepting, like, cool, new things, you know, oh, the great yes. Yeah. And when they actually got into the product, they thought it was going to be really complicated. And when we showed them, it's not. Mm -hmm. When you present that storage to VMware, yeah. there you go, it's just a couple clicks and you're done. When you actually want to upgrade ESXi, it's one click and you're done. And they're like, that sounds too simple. And the other ones that just didn't want to, you know, they're, they're fine with what they're doing. Yep. It, it made it easy to document it to actually pass it over because it is very simply laid out the way Nutanix does it. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Joe, we, we've been tracking Nutanix for, for quite a while. We were at the .next conference actually and Nutanix positioned themselves as an enterprise cloud company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, does, does Carlisle have, do you have a cloud strategy? How does Nutanix fit into that discussion? You know, what do you think of all the buzzwords that people throw around? Sure, you know? <laughs> because we have all these different sites, it was great to have a remote office, business office, set block of Nutanix, but we do have a private cloud. And in that private cloud, it, it made it very easy not only to do offsite replication, but it also became our DR. Right. And so it made it very simple to capture the block level snapshots very quickly, import them off to our private cloud, which we have a huge stack of Nutanix. Mm. So with some of the announcements at the show today, uh, VMware on, on AWS is, mm -hmm. is a thing. So are you are you VMware based on the Nutanix? Yes, we are. Yeah, so are you looking to use something like VMware on AWS to extend outside your private cloud? That's a great question because not every site fits the bill. Right. Okay, so we do have certain sites that are even smaller. Mm -hmm. Where do we put their stuff? Well, they don't have a closet. Well, it doesn't feasible to send them a block. So yeah. using that service is exactly what I will be suggesting okay. for these smaller sites because they need their data. And you know, everything going to cloud is only as good as your internet connectivity. Yeah. If that should halt, falter, you know, jitter, your production line stops. That's a problem. That was, that's one of the main reasons why you still have on-prem, mm. private cloud, as compared to someone else managing it, which is total cloud. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Joe, talk to us a little bit about your application portfolio, how you manage that. Did you know, switching over to uh, Nutanix, you know, 
change anything? Is we talk about kind of you know older applications? I don't know what you're doing with anything that you'd call cloud native, but uh, right. you know, I'd like to understand from an application standpoint what well, you're doing. Well, that's a great thing. It yeah. didn't. Yeah. So we were able to change our infrastructure in seamless changeover, if you will, you know, from one hardware backend to another, hmm. and it they saw nothing, which is great. You know, the whole okay. point is is IT doing its job. Well, do you notice anything we're doing? No. Then we're doing our job. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Do you get any credit though when you when everything just works and then, you know everyone, it's like plumbing it's brilliant until it breaks but and you just assume that it's there right. do, how do you how do you actually show visibility and 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 show that we're doing a great job reward us give us more stuff that's the responsibility of my leadership right okay. so it's for them to see but do I go around tuning my horn no yeah. we all did it so whenever I refer to IT it's never I it's we IT did it right. we did it and so everyone obviously has to have the credit because we're all doing the same effort. Yeah, yeah. Joe, I'm, I'm curious, since you, you're pretty thoughtful, you've got a corporate strategy. When you implement a Nutanix, if you look back, do you have metrics, or metrics are sometimes we call hero numbers that say, right, here's, we're this much more efficient, or heck, I've got this stack of projects on the side that never got done. Uh, I talked to one Nutanix customer once, he's like, yeah, you know that two-year-old security project that I kept kicking down the road? He's like, now I did it. So, right. you know, what, 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 what can you kind of markedly go to, uh, in, 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 you know, whether it's a, a metric or, you know, new projects that you've gotten to do. Sure. Not only we're we able to expand very quickly, especially with storage is concerned. So new projects come on that require terabytes of space. How do we dynamically grow that immediately? So another way uh, we were able to do that was also backups and DR. Okay. So to actually have backups and DR at a certain level and get them offsite replicated, we actually were able to get rid of our tape backups. So that was another thing. Do we want to renew this old legacy storage method for something that's faster, more dynamic. We don't have to put it on tape, we just ship it off site, mm -hmm. you know, via our connection to our private cloud. And so we're able to do that, saving quite a bit of money. And because remember, we grew through acquisition, everybody had their own backup strategy. Right. Everyone had all these different products. We're like, we're going to change all that, get rid of that, and get rid of your tape drives. Everybody's like, thank you, thank you very much. And I, I felt really good. I'm like, well, I'm glad you like it because it's better. Yeah, it sounds like you've built a really uh, a, a strategic resource for your organization, really, in, in being able to do M&A very, very well, and having the, the ability to absorb new ideas and, and then roll them out across the board. Has that resulted in an increase in M&A activity? Because, oh, well, actually, we're good at this, so we can go and do more things, because the risk of the acquisition not working very well, or not being implemented very well, is so much lower. Right, well, the idea that the work will never stop coming. Right. But it did provide us more time it gave us more elbow room to move around, especially uh, once we actually moved everything into it, our budget actually shrank because we didn't have okay. to buy all these different facets to go along with it. Right. So Nutanix allowed us to do that. Okay. All right, so Joe, you talk, you, you're a VMware customer, you're a Nutanix customer, I'm uh, sure, sure there's more in the stack of, of your private cloud. The question I have for you is, what's on your list of your wish list? You know, what would make your life even easier? I mean, of course, lower prices, you know, uh, that, that, that kind of stuff right. is, is a given, but you know, what, 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 what's on your roadmap uh, that you'd like to see from the ecosystem? You know, I'd like to see certain things come together. Many of the products, especially that are showing here, are showing a lot of overlap. Where do I find my, my information easily? Some products aren't as easy as others. That's why there's vendors saying, look, we can bolt onto that, we can make it easier for you. Yeah. So there's a few facets of performance, a few facets of tracking and logging and aggregation. How do we put more of that data together? And that's what's happening. I like to see all those products start overlapping APIs, saying we can provide you that information. That's what makes it so wonderful to come to VMworld okay. and see all the vendors' products because you try to Google for what you need, you're, you're going to be lost. You need a little bit of help. But to be able to come here and see what's going on here, you actually get these little mini conferences, if you will, mm. Every 15 minutes, you can have a new conversation about, you know what, that fills my need, that fills the hole I was looking for. Mm. Has there been any sort of standout vendor or someone that you didn't know about that you've seen here at the show and that's impressed you? Now, the AWS one, that was impressive because I didn't know that was going to come to fruition. I okay. didn't know when it was going to be launched. So it's great that that was happening. Uh, there's a few other companies, and forgive me, I forget their names, but the way they bolted on to 
VMware to actually show you stats, what are people doing, especially in VDI instances, how do you yeah. see somebody YouTubing and they're cutting down the bandwidth, you know, how do you find that one person, that one key thing that's right. killing it for everybody? Okay. Now there's software to see that. Awesome. Uh, Joe, I want to give you the final word. You know, what brings you back to a show like VMworld? You've been here a couple of times. What, what's your favorite things? What, do you, what, what really gets you going? Putting all the vendors together. Yeah. Having the huge room where you can walk, talk, get the paperwork, get contacts, set up proof of concepts within a few minutes and go to the next one, that's, that's valuable to me. Getting the information, if you don't know, then you're lost. All right, well, Joe Cowan, really appreciate you, you, you joining us. Uh, so much information, uh, Justin Warren, and I'm Stu Miniman. We're going to be back with more coverage here as we're getting towards the end of day two of three of theCUBE's coverage of VMworld 2017. Thanks so much, you're watching theCUBE.